Welcome to ISSR In Conversation on the ISSR YouTube channel and podcast. As always, I'm Anthony K. Nairn, ISSR Executive Assistant. ISSR has recently completed a large grant generously funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation titled Understanding Spiritual Intelligence, SI for short. This four-part series, which was recorded on Zoom between 28 June and 10 July 2023, arises from the conclusion of the SI grant and the research done for it. In the wake of the ISSR 2023 Summer Conference on Artificial and Spiritual Intelligence, the speakers here in this series were critical in bringing together the research and deliverables for this project. This first part, titled Spiritual Intelligence, The Very Idea, has ISSR Executive Secretary Fraser Watts provide an overview of the project and offers some detail on the motivations and challenges of the project itself. We are then joined by ISSR fellow Marius Dorobantu, who provides an interesting context to the idea of artificial intelligence, theology, and the challenges and problems raised by general artificial intelligence having spiritual intelligence. We then conclude with ISSR fellow Harris Wiseman offering some discussion questions for both Fraser and Marius. Please enjoy this first episode of a special four-part series of ISSR's In Conversation on the topic of spiritual intelligence, the very idea. So um, a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us here. There may be more joining us shortly and we'll record this. It will be on the ISSR YouTube channel so you can re-watch it later or um, direct your friends to it if you think you'd like to do that. But a warm welcome to this session. It's the, it's the first of four sessions which are arising from um, a, a research project that ISSR has had running for nearly three years, funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. The sessions arise from that project and also to some extent from the in-person conference that we held last week. Um, most of you will have the schedule for the forthcoming meetings. The next one is on next Monday, slightly different time. And that's about spiritual conversations with machine companions. But this one is about spiritual intelligence, the very idea, and theology and AI. I'm going to be the first speaker, and then um, Marius Dorabantu will speak next on theology and AI. Then I'll invite Harris Wiseman to comment or raise questions about those two talks and add anything he wishes to from his own point of view, and then we'll throw the meeting open for anyone who wants to join in. So my talk is about the marks of spiritual intelligence. And for those who find it helpful, there's um, a short handout in the chat that you can open if you wish that just sort of guides you through the, the structure of what I'm going to say. I'm proposing that there is something we can reasonably call spiritual intelligence, but I find that proposal gets misunderstood, so I want to start off by clarifying what I am and am not proposing. I'm not proposing that there is a wholly distinct and separate kind of spiritual intelligence that is unlike anything else. But I am proposing that there are characteristic ways in which spiritual intelligence operates in two kinds of settings, in spiritually mature people in much of their lives, and in a particular way in spiritual practices of various kinds. So I'm not proposing that there is a completely separate kind of spiritual intelligence. Some of you will be familiar with the multiple intelligences framework of Howard Gardner. He proposes a list of intelligences, and in one of his books, he goes through eight criteria that need to be met for a candidate intelligence to be added to the list. And he concludes that spiritual intelligence doesn't meet the criteria. I think he's right. 
Um, rather strangely, he then goes on to talk about something else called existential intelligence that he thinks does meet the criteria, but I don't think that meets the criteria any better than spiritual intelligence, so I part company with him then. I'm not going to go in detail through all his criteria, I'm just going to mention a couple of them. One is that this particular a candidate intelligence needs to have a distinct evolutionary history. I think there's an interesting evolutionary history for spiritual intelligence, but it's one that indicates that it piggybacks on other things. So I'm influenced by Robin Dunbar and his recent brain, uh, his recent book on how religion evolved. Um, I think one of the important evolutionary origins of um, religion is in the trance dancing practices of early humans that delivered collective endorphin release and social bonding and healing and various other things um, from which uh, religion, um, as we now know it, um, eventually flowed when you got stable settlements. So there's an interesting evolutionary history. I think the evolutionary history of religion is also connected with the evolution of play, particularly with pretend play. And it seems as though pretend play and religion kind of co-evolve. And um, that's another interesting story. I'm not going to go into detail about this. In terms of brain structures, there's been an interest for a lot of time in a sort of God spot in the brain or a spiritual spot. And the current focus of interest is in an area of the midbrain called the periductal gray. And it looks from analysis of people with brain damage that that may be particularly important in underpinning spiritual experience, but there's quite a lot else that that area of the brain does um, pain management, altruism, and other things. So again, there's nothing that's distinct in evolution or brain that is distinct to spiritual intelligence. So I think it's not a separate and distinct mode of intelligence. It's helpful to back up here and to, and to note that um, it's this wide agreement that humans have two different modes of central cognition. Though this is widely accepted, the terminology is slightly different and it confuses things that no two people use the same terminology. But I think the broad conclusion is, um, is one that there's a great deal of agreement about. And I think that's really important for under understanding how human intelligences group. It's a distinction that's um, um, important in um, a particular cognitive architecture that I've worked quite a lot with and others as well, Philip Barnard's Interacting Cognitive Subsystems, a cognitive architecture of nine different subsystems, nine in humans, um, though he traces the evolutionary story of how you get from um, just of a four subsystem architecture in animals like wolves to a nine subsystem architecture in humans and the various evolutionary pressures that lead to the addition of additional, um, uh, additional subsystems. <clears throat> in his model, other species have just one central subsystem, a multimodal central processing system. Humans distinctively probably uniquely have two. They have a um, implicational intelligence, which is um, derived from the multimodal processing of uh, other, other primates. And they also have a distinctive kind of conceptual intelligence, which is linked to our extraordinary language ability. I recognize that other species have some language ability, but our language ability is vastly superior to that of any other um, species. I'm proposing that intelligences break down into two groups. There are those that are primarily conceptual intelligences, 
making use of this new capacity that humans have to an extraordinary extent for conceptual intelligence. But there are others that make important use as well of the intuitive um, um, intellectual capacity. And for those intelligences to flourish, there seems to be a need to rely less on conceptual intelligence and to rebalance things in a more even-handed way. I'm not pushing this to the extreme of saying that conceptual intelligence is shut down with intelligences like spiritual intelligence, but I think it is um, it, it, it is pushed back into, into a more secondary role so that the more intuitive intelligences have freer reign. So I think there's a group of intelligences that are make important use of our um, in of this older kind of cognitive capacity that is intuitive and embodied and affective and holistic. And in that family of intelligence, I'd put moral intelligence, um, um, spiritual intelligence, social intelligence, aesthetic intelligence, that may not be an exhaustive list, but I think there's a lot of similarity in how those intelligences operate. They are not primarily conceptual intelligences. They make important use as well of our um, more intuitive cognitive capacities. So, um, these, these two kinds of um, cognition that humans have, I think one of those, the conceptual intelligence has been quite well replicated in, uh, um, in machines. Machines don't do things in the way humans do, as my colleague Marius will probably say in a moment, it is um, machine intelligence is generally human level, but not human like. But I think our conceptual intelligence has been, with that caveat, replicated quite well in, in machines. Our intuitive intelligence is similar to what you find in other species. So I think humans are perhaps unique in bringing these two kinds of, of intelligence together. That gives us an extraordinary cognitive versatility. It also gives us some problems. What I want to do now is to go through some of the of the marks of spiritual intelligence, and quite a number of these would also be true of other intuitive intelligences in that family that I just mentioned. Spiritual intelligence is ineffable, as William James pointed out long ago in his uh, famous lectures on varieties of religious experience. People have a sense that they understand something of spiritual importance that they can't quite articulate, particularly important in mystical experience. I think there are both theological and cognitive reasons why you get ineffability, and I'm happy to have both. There's been quite a bit of discussion over the years about the theological reasons that there's a sense in which God is beyond human description, maybe not an object at all, and theologians often say that God is a subject, not an object, so because of that, not describable. That may be one reason why experiences of God are ineffable. But I think there are also cognitive reasons to do with the structure of the cognitive architecture, why spiritual experiences can't easily be articulated. Um, that the <clears throat> um, our conceptual intelligence has a route by which things can be put into linguistic form and articulated, but our intuitive intelligence does not have any such route. What has to happen if you're going to um, 
put an, an intuitive experience into words, you have to move it across into the conceptual intelligence system, which involves recoding it, and, and, and then go from there into linguistic formulations. And I think that fits what you see with, with mystics. It's not the mystics have been unable to say anything about mystical experiences. They often write at some length about them, Julian of Norwich, for example. But they're very conscious of the difficulty of doing so, and that when they eventually put it into words, what they are, what they are then describing somehow misses the point. It's not quite what the original experience was. And I think that exactly fits with what you'd expect from um, um, my, my assumption derived from Philip Barnard's cognitive architecture, that the experience, the meaning has to be recoded before it can be put into words. My next mark is that spiritual intelligence is characteristically embodied. And again, this is shared, I think, with other um, intelligences in the intuitive group. And again, it flows from the structure of the cognitive architecture that body state feeds into um, intuitive intelligence in a way that it doesn't feed into conceptual intelligence. Our intuitions are shaped by what's happening in our, in our bodies in a way that our conceptual thinking is not to the same extent. There's been a lot of interest in psychology recently in embodied cognition and the growing recognition that cognition is embodied. But I suggest that not all cognition is equally embodied and that intuitive um, cognition um, is much more embodied than conceptual cognition. It's more heavily connected with the, with the rest of the body. For example, the um, um, non-dominant non hemisphere uh, is much better connected with the rest of the whole body than, than the um, left hemisphere, which in most people is dev devoted to language. And, and um, spiritual intelligence makes a lot of use of movement and gesture. Religious rituals do that. And religious concepts often link um, spiritual meanings with um, um, more physical material meanings in a, in a kind of dual aspect meaning. And the classic one is, is the, um, you find in languages like Hebrew, where the same word means both spirit and wind breath. This is what you might expect of an embodied intelligence. I'm also suggesting that spiritual intelligence is a, a whole person intelligence. Our conceptual intelligence is often sort of narrowly intellectual, rationalistic, whereas our intuitive intelligence, including spiritual intelligence, affects our thoughts and feelings and behavior. It's a much broader kind of whole person intelligence. And there's a different mode of processing. And you see this particularly in how people use language. The spiritual use of language is, um, has some distinctive features. It generally goes slowly. It doesn't sort of rush or gabble um, in the way that conceptual intelligence often does. Um, it goes slowly and it goes deep. It's a kind of deep processing that gets below surface features and seems to be scanning for underlying schemas that um, reveal the significance of what's happening, not just what is happening, but its meaning and significance. It often looks for schemas that um, occur in, in different situations and in Christian thought, the death resurrection schema is very prominent. Obviously it occurs in the culmination of the story of, of Jesus. It's also applied in baptism. It's also applied in how people cope with a variety of different experiences. 
it's a mode of processing that in the terminology of philosophers goes for connotation rather than denotation about the associations of what is experienced rather than just what is experienced. <clears throat> and it's kind of processing that is um, alert and expectant. It's not sleepy. It, it um, is hoping and expecting something of spiritual significance to be disclosed. But I think it often keeps an open mind about what it is looking for. And Rowan Williams and I have both gravitated to the analogy of bird watching. Um, if you go bird watching, you are alert for what you might see, but you keep an open mind about what that might be, and you're prepared to be surprised. I suggest there's something in spiritual intelligence um, about a willingness to be surprised that is quite important. There's a well-known book by um, um, an Ignatian spiritual writer, God of Surprises, Gerard Hughes. This willingness to be uh, to be surprised, to be open-minded, but willing and and willing to be surprised, but still alert and expectant. This may be a, a significant difference between religion and spirituality. I think the spiritual mindset is usually open-minded. Religion can be open-minded, but it's not always. There are dogmatic forms of religion, and the, and the, but there aren't dogmatic forms of spirituality, I sense, in quite the same way. Just two more of these marks of intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is participatory, rather than objectifying. And it's helpful to put this in historical context. There seems to have been a significant move towards a new objectifying kind of intelligence in the 17th century. The age of the so-called scientific revolution, even though science didn't come to be used as commonly as it now is and in the way it now is until the 19th century. So I think the big insight of the 17th century was that if you stand back from things and don't get too personally involved and study them in an objective a way as you can, you understand them better. And in theology, that gave rise to a new kind of natural theology. I think the track record of that objectifying um, approach to the world has been in some ways very positive. It's led to extraordinary advances in human understanding, but it's not the way that spiritual intelligence understands things. Spiritual intelligence, I suggest, is always participatory, never standing back. If you want to understand God, you can't understand God by standing back in a, in a, in a quasi-scientific um, way. Um, there are sometimes some misunderstandings of what theology is along these lines, but whatever theology might be, it cannot possibly be human studying God in a quasi-objective way. It can't be that. You always have to get involved and to... Um, engage with God in order to understand God. And lastly, spiritual intelligence is a kind of relational intelligence. It's a kind of person-to-person -person intelligence rather than a person-to-object intelligence. It's I-thou rather than I-it. It's a connection between two beings rather than the connection between a person and an object. I could probably add other marks of spiritual intelligence, and sometimes I've I've uh, I've uh, um, done a slightly longer list, but I think those are the key hallmarks of spiritual intelligence as I understand it. Just to return now to spiritual practices, I think spiritual practices in various different ways reduce the dominance of conceptual cognition. Uh, so as to allow 
um, spiritual intelligence to operate in the kind of way that I've, I've been describing. It looks as though all spiritual practices do that in some way or other, though they perhaps do it in slightly different ways. In And formulating this in terms of Barnard's interacting cognitive subsystems, it looks as though in some spiritual practices there's a shrinkage of activity into, into just one or two subsystems. In mindfulness, the shrinkage is largely into kind of intuitive cognition and body state. There are other, other spiritual practices in which more of the subsystems are, are kept active, but in a way that is um, enmeshed. So everything is working together in a coordinated, holistic way, rather than as often happens in human life, where multitasking, doing different things with different parts of our cognitive capacity. So I think that's true of the Jesus prayer, for example. I mean, if you're saying the Jesus prayer, there's some language going on, there's some articulation going on. If you if you've got a prayer rope, you're 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 feeling that as well. Um, um, there are a whole lot of things going on, but as I say, in a kind of enmeshed, highly coordinated way. I think this cognitive architecture interacting cognitive, cognitive subsystems has more potential for um, mapping out um, the different ways in which um, different spiritual practices can um, provide an opportunity for spiritual intelligence. But that's what I want to say for now. So I'll bring my talk to an end there. And there'll be an opportunity for questions and discussion later on. But right now, I'd like to hand over to my, um, my colleague, Maria Storabantu, at the Free University in Amsterdam, to talk about theology and AI. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about spiritual intelligence, theology, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we conceptualize spiritual intelligence as this very different mode of knowing that seems to be typically human, uh, one that is more holistic, relational, embodied, participative, seeking deeper, deep, deeper meanings, uh, wrestling with perplexity without looking for easy answers, and all the other characteristics that Fraser mentions. Um, I think there are, uh, we can think about this, uh, uh, our study uh, as being based on, or on four pillars for conceptualizing what spiritual intelligence is. Um, one of the pillars is this idea that um, spiritually mature people from various traditions seem to have in common many of these features in their attitude to life and relationships with other humans and the divine. Another pillar uh, of this idea is rooted in the in cognitive science and psychology. Uh, it was important to conceptualize what is special about how the human mind is being deployed uh, in spiritual practices, uh, such as mindfulness, the Jesus prayer, or other types of meditation. Here, the interactive cognitive, uh, interacting cognitive subsystems architecture developed by Philip Barnard and John Tisdale, who I saw is with us today, uh, was particularly helpful uh, with this distinction between uh, two main modes of cognition, uh, something that we might in a simplified way call uh, the two minds that coexist inside each of us, one that is more logical and linguistic, the other more holistic and intuitive. And Fraser has done some groundbreaking work in applying this framework uh, to a computational modeling of spiritual practices. Uh, what he showed is that such practices help rebalance these two minds by temporarily silencing or reducing uh, the emphasis on the propositional mind to allow uh, the reprioritization of the more intuitive holistic mode of cognition. And uh, how spiritual intelligence presupposes a healthy, um, balanced relationship between these two minds with propositional cognition recruited in the service of the more open-minded holistic cognition. And this is very similar to how Ian McGilchrist 
speaks of uh, the role of the emissary as the servant to his master when he talks about uh, the healthy relationship between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. Uh, besides these two, there are two uh, other pillars underpinning our project, uh, of which I'd like to tell you a little bit more about today. One is uh, artificial intelligence. The other uh, is a more philosophical and theological angle. Now, philosopher Harris Wiseman, who, is, who will talk after me, has done a tremendous work relating the idea of spiritual intelligence with some of the Eastern philosophical tra traditions and uh, the use of language in ritual practices. So I will talk a little bit about the theology and artificial intelligence parts. One interesting application of the notion of spiritual intelligence at the intersection between AI and theology is in discussions about human distinctiveness from non-human animals and intelligent machines. Uh, as you will see, this kind of conceptualization of spiritual intelligence can have exciting implications for how we think about human distinctiveness and the notion of image of God in theological anthropology. The other idea that I want to briefly talk about is the question about uh, whether intelligent machines could ever acquire spiritual intelligence. Uh, especially in the past few months with the emergence of chat GPT, the questions around such uh, programs ability to exhibit human uh, level intelligence have an intensified. So it is worth uh, to explore whether our conceptualization of spiritual intelligence has any implication for such uh, hypothetical scenarios. I will start with, uh, with discussions about the image of God. So uh, the image of God is traditionally um, a very uh, hotly debated topic in theological anthropology, because on the one hand, it is at the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, uh, it defines what it means to be human. Uh, but on the other hand, there is very little uh, material in the Bible itself to, to draw uh, more uh, information about what it could mean. So that's why uh, throughout the centuries from patristic authors up until uh, modern theologians, there has been this hot debate of what does it mean to be in the image of God? Um, and there is no agreement. There are many proposals. Uh, the only agreement is that perhaps the image of God is something that makes us like God, uh, and then perhaps it distinguishes us from other creatures, although there are theologians who uh, would perfectly embrace uh, the whole creation uh, to be in the image of God, perhaps uh, in a matter of degree. And then also there's this Christian layer added on top of the Hebrew Bible, which says that Jesus Christ is the perfect image. So when we look at the person of Jesus Christ, we can draw some conclusions about what it means to be in the image of God. But uh, all this is uh, is a little bit too vague, of course. and um, uh, if we are to look at the various interpretations of what, what it means to be in the image of God, they can be grouped in, uh, in four big categories, substantial, functional, relational, and eschatological. And I will talk a little bit about, uh, about each of those. Uh, the dominant interpretation uh, for most of Christian history has been the substantial interpretation, which means that uh, to be in the image of God is to have uh, some special intellectual capacity, perhaps reason. Uh, this was uh, one of the, the best candidates, especially in patristic literature, um, because God is intelligent. So perhaps our intelligence, which also seems to distinguish us from uh, to distinguish us from the animals, perhaps this is what makes us like God and unlike the animals. And this is also very much rooted in the Aristotelian tradition uh, uh, of seeing humans as uh, the rational animal. So uh, we are animals, but with added rationality. So now the question is, well, could spiritual intelligence be such an intellectual capacity? And um, well, uh, let's just say that the substantial interpretation uh, has suffered uh, um, a very uh, strong setback, uh, especially since Darwin and the uh, evolutionary theory came through. Because uh, what we used to regard as very typical human capacities, now we know that they are found in some form, uh, uh, quite advanced sometimes, also in non-human animals, in primates, in dolphins, in, and sometimes even in uh, birds or uh, octopuses and so on. So uh, it, is very it is very difficult to, to pinpoint to one 
the specific capacity that only humans have and to, to designate that as the uh, uh, locus of, of, of the image of God. Um, but because, uh, because evolutionary theory presented theology with this problem, uh, actually theology flourished because of this, uh, in my opinion, because theologians came with very interesting proposals for how to interpret the, uh, the image of God differently. So I was telling you about these other three categories, uh, which are the functional interpretation, which is that humans uh, uh, we are called to do something to, to represent God in creation, to exercise stewardship, dominion. Then there's the relational interpretation that uh, the image of God is really our relationship with God and the very uh, profound relationality of our nature. Uh, and also there's this eschatological interpretation, which is that we have this uh, this uh, wrestleness, this this um, uh, we are attracted to this to this great gravitational pull that is God, uh, spiritually speaking, and uh, because we have this wrestleness, perhaps this is what it means to be in the image of God, of God to be called towards God, toward this uh, with this kind of uh, very esoteric uh, feeling. Well, uh, I all these interpretations are beautiful, and uh, I think they all make sense theologically. And that's what uh, that's one of the problems because um, it's very difficult to to to, re to to choose one of them that is perhaps uh, better theologically articulated than the others. And also, uh, in in light of our comparison with non-human animals, uh, they are all uh, uh, equally likely to be true if you, if we are to think about this in a very scientific methodology framework so uh, we have these various hypotheses and we try to see which one makes best sense of our data and uh, they all make sense so in a sense uh, we don't have enough constraint because uh, uh, there are so many things that uh, we do differently than the animals although there is no single capacity still humans are very different so uh, there is this theological conundrum and my idea was to think of artificial intelligence as a as a as a new data point on in our space of uh, um, of, of of possible minds and also uh, of um, of possible creatures. So perhaps if we look at AI, uh, which uh, emerged in the past few decades, uh, um, this brings a new challenge, but also some opportunities. Uh, the challenge is that. AI is mastering very well some of the things that we we were absolutely sure that are 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 the epitome of of, of being human, which is exactly this kind of very rational problem solving type of intelligence, logical, algorithmical. But these were the first things that were mastered with AI. So uh, problem uh, theorem proving, uh, chess playing, uh, th these were quite easy for AI in a certain sense. Whereas other things uh, that um, that humans do and that look almost trivial to us, for example, just navigating a landscape with some obstacles, uh, that is quite difficult for for robots to do. So, uh, in in saying that, uh, I also hint at the opportunities brought by AI, because I think AI can be used as a clue for what the image of God is not, if you if you want. Um, AI uh, and and in doing that we can do that by looking at both its successes and failures as I, I tried to uh, just try to exemplify but also I think when we look at AI perhaps current AI well it's progressing but still there are so many differences and it does things so differently than we do uh, perhaps a better um, hypothesis for us or a more helpful hypothesis is the hypothesis of human level intelligence or artificial general intelligence agi uh, and if we imagine that kind of uh, uh entity whether it's possible or not it's hotly debated but perhaps uh imagining such a such such a very advanced ai uh and then trying to figure out which of this uh, interpretations of the image of God uh, still stands such a such a hypothetical scenario is a fruitful theological uh, endeavor. Uh, so I did a lot of that. I'm not going to go too much into details. What I'm going to say is that uh, if you look at these three interpretations from that prism of what AI could be doing, uh, both the functional and the eschatological uh, interpretations can be, uh, in a, to, to a certain extent, uh, be reduced to the relational one. Uh, 
So because, of course, uh, AI could take better care of creation than we do. This is a very uh, thought-provoking scenario where the AI, because of its uh, capacity to, 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 to look at so many things at the same time and to have this processing power, uh, AI could be, make better decisions than we do in some respects. It already does in terms of landing planes or running the stock market. But some people go as far as to say, well, we should, with, if an AI advances far enough, we should hand it uh, the keys, so to say, so that because it would it would probably uh, be a, a, a more fair um, a ruler of the world than humans are sometimes, who are biased, who are uh, have all kinds of uh, cognitive vulnerabilities. And uh, if you look at that, yes, it looks uh, uh, at the face of it, it looks true. But then, um, so AI in a functional interpretation, AI perhaps would be a better steward of creation. Uh, or I don't subscribe to that, but. Uh, uh, for the uh, just for, for the sake of playing devil's advocate here, we could say that. But then uh, if we are to still regard humans as special in such a scenario, then we have to look at the relational aspect of the function, function interpretation that humans are never called to exercise this kind of stewardship or dominion over creation in a vacuum. This is always performed in a relationship with God and has a teleology in God. So uh, uh, God does not appoint us to just make sure that the animals have a better life and uh, they live longer and happier, that as well. But uh, if you if you look at the theology of uh, uh, of, of the image of God, uh, then uh, there's also this spiritual dimension that humans are priests of creation. They are called to elevate creation to 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 a, to a to a higher spiritual status uh, in their relationship with God and make uh, make the created world a transparent medium for the relationship between persons who are human and divine. So. Um, Long story short, uh, the function interpretation can only survive this human level AI scenario if it emphasizes its, its relational aspect. And the same can be said about the eschatological interpretation, because what is this exocentricity that is built in deep within humans than, uh, than, than an aspect of our relationship with God? Um, so then the, the, the question becomes, uh, what if machines become one day capable of personal relationships? Uh, we already have conversations with chatbots. It's not unimaginable that in the future we might talk to machines as we currently talk to humans, which is the essence of Turing's test. So would an AI capable of human level conversations really engage in personal authentic relationships? Would it also be in the image of God in a relational interpretation? And intuitively, we might say that just displaying relational-like behavior uh, does not mean that an authentic relationship is actually being formed, right? Uh, especially when uh, we think about how humans, uh, how human relationality is very much underpinned by a complex cognitive architecture, which also enables spiritual intelligence. So we humans do not simulate relationships. Our intelligence is eminently relational because this is how we engage with the world and with each other in a relational way. Also, uh, a genuine self or consciousness is needed for this kind of I though type of uh, relationship. And humans are such selves, while, while uh, inanimate objects are not. Uh, humans are someone, while machines are something, at least for now. Uh, nobody is at home uh, inside these machines yet. Uh, but we don't know if that will be the case forever because um, we don't have we don't understand consciousness sentience. So it would be really tough to decide whether an AI that acted as if it were conscious really was, or whether it was just simulating it. Um, a robot that uh, claiming to be in love, to suffer, or to believe in God uh, would pose challenging ethical, philosophical, and theological problems. How would we even know whether it's telling the truth? Uh, we could probably never say that for sure, to be honest, but there are good reasons to believe that AI, even a sentient version of it, would be so alien-like that concepts like personhood or authentic personal relationship would not be applicable when describing it. And I'll detail my reasons for thinking that shortly. For now, let's just say that the relational interpretation uh, could still account for human distinctiveness in such a scenario. And the kind of personal relationships that we have with each other will not necessarily be part of the robot's behavioral repertoire. Our relationality is very much connected with our vulnerability. 
we engage in relationships precisely because we are vulnerable and mortal and we need one another. Uh, there can be no genuine relationship with, without the two partners making themselves vulnerable to, uh, to each other beyond any transactional logic. Uh, this is why deep relationships are always risky because of the looming possibility of getting hurt. But without such, um, such um, voluntary vulnerability, uh, how could anything deep and meaningful ever emerge? So how could an artificial being, which is virtually invulnerable and immortal, having copied backups of itself on multiple computers, engage in human-like relationships? Uh, in Christian theology, this powerful idea that vulnerability is instrumental for authentic relationality is manifest in the doctrine of the incarnation. God does not shy away from vulnerability, but quite the contrary. Uh, through Jesus Christ, we see God subjecting uh, God's self to the ultimate vulnerability of suffering and death on the cross. As humans, we image God when we are loving and vulnerable, not when we are mighty and unbreakable. So if we look at the image of God from the prism of the incarnation and evolutionary theory, uh, and also what we conceptualize about spiritual intelligence, we can ask the following question, what kind of creature was needed to evolve for God to be able to incarnate and have personal relationship with. Uh, if we look at it this way, then some degree of intelligence and rationality seems uh, seem necessar necessary for Imago Dei. Perhaps a certain threshold needs to be crossed or else God could, could have incarnated as a, another animal like a reptile or something, which we think did not happen. Uh, spiritual intelligence requires both type of minds, the holistic intuitive and the rational discursive. But then if we triangulate Christology and evolutionary theory with AI, we might also speak of an upper limit for the rational type of intelligence. Uh, we see machines that are hyper-rational, much more than we could ever be, and precisely because of that, they fall outside the scope of beings who can form personal relationships, therefore also unable to relate to God in the way we do. It is unlikely that a creature who makes all his decisions based on cold calculations of optimal outcomes will engage in such risky and irrational behavior as personal relationships. We humans seek relationships because we have a sense of incompleteness and deep hunger for uh, a kind of fulfillment that cannot be achieved solely uh, within ourselves. Unlike the AI, we do not entirely understand our internal states and motivations. So we try to know ourselves better in relationship with others. That incompleteness uh, drives our religiosity or why we seek God. It drives uh, us to seek the compassion of other humans. Um, and it is this restfulness of our hearts, uh, as Augustine called it, uh, uh, that comes deep from within ourselves uh, below, uh, from below our rational minds. Uh, and a purely rational being would not behave like this. So falling in love is certainly not a rational thing to do. For such seemingly rational things, we need to allow the intuitive, embodied, effective mind to take charge. Uh, and, but it is such irrational things, and I, I put scare quotes around irrational, uh, from love to art to spirituality, that make human life enjoyable. So perhaps it is precisely because we are not as intelligent as AI that we can Im image God relationally. And with this, I arrive at the controversial conclusion that intelligence understood only in terms of uh, uh, problem solving and the rational paradigm that is measured by IQ might actually hinder personhood, human likeness and relationality after a certain point. I'm thinking of a Goldilocks of rational intelligence. Goldilocks points to a sweet spot uh, in planetary science where uh, uh, it is not too hot or not too cold for uh, a planet to have liquid water. Uh, and it is precisely what Fraser was talking about when he was placing humans between uh, animals and machines. Uh, to be the kind of creatures that we are, we need to be in sort of a Goldilocks of intelligence somewhere between animals and machines. So the tantalizing idea is that had we been more rational, as some transhumanists hope to become by augmenting uh, themselves, we might have fallen outside the scope of the image of God. In terms of what renders us in the image of God, 
uh, less is sometimes more, at least when it comes to this very logical type of intelligence. And then I'm moving to the second question, which is could intelligence machines ever acquire spiritual intelligence? And uh, I was asking this question when uh, a year ago, uh, a first chatbot, one developed by Google, uh, a sort of precursor to OpenAI's ChatGPT, was beta tested by, by an engineer who started to believe that it has uh, uh, it has be, uh, awakened to sentience and uh, it is it is a person it is sentient and very interestingly the Google engineer made those claims based on the kind of things the chatbot was saying in the realm of spirituality uh, a belief in God uh, a fear of death so some existential questions. So, um, well, that raised the question, well, these chatbots will, will get better and better, and at some point they will claim that they, they, they believe in God or they are spiritual intelligent or in, in, interested in spirituality. So there's a question of how could we even, uh, how could we even decide that? Uh, is, is that true? So that's why I thought it, it is useful to think whether AI in its current form or but also in its future forms could uh, also um, exhibit this kind of spiritual intelligence. And actually the question can be posed reversely. Uh, could uh, artificial general intelligence, so uh, this uh, holy grail of AI, human level intelligence, could it not entail spiritual intelligence? Uh, could you have AGI without spiritual intelligence? And I ask this sincerely because nothing I see in the discussions about uh, uh, AGI seem to even consider the possibility. Uh, and maybe this is because of the focus in AI on measurable performance or, or outward behavior. Uh, if it manifests human level or superhuman level intelligence in enough domains, and if it has this elusive, uh, flexible type of intelligence that can be easily transferred from one domain to another, which by the way, ChatGPT does not. Uh, but so it doesn't matter uh, how AI reasons on the inside, uh, or indeed if there's any inside at all, uh, all that matters is whether from the outside it is indistinguishable from humans. This is the Turing test. So sentience, for example, is not a prerequisite for AGI, but could we imagine something being spiritually intelligent without having any degree of subjectivity or first person experience? How can we even approach uh, the question of whether future robots might also be spiritually intelligent? Uh, this is highly speculative, of course, but I think one fruitful possibility is to look at the prevalence of spiritual intelligence uh, around us and in the evolution of uh, intelligent life on earth. So um, spiritual intelligence does not look like a great attractor or a convergent convergence point in the terminology used by Simon Conway Morris. Uh, in evolutionary science, convergence points are features that many species de develop independently from, uh, from one another on different pathways and at different times. For example, flight or sight are such convergent points because it seems that if life is given enough time on a habitable planet, most of the times the processes of evolution through natural selection will lead to the development of such capacities. Uh, general intelligence related to problem solving abilities seems to be such a convergent point because many species develop this kind of intelligence independently uh, from one another. Uh, and perhaps we could also expect artificial life uh, to also converge to, to, towards such problem-solving abilities. But uh, that doesn't seem to be the case for spiritual intelligence. It doesn't look inevitable that if you give life enough time, it will eventually develop spiritual intelligence. Quite the contrary, it seems pretty contingent on the unique structure of the human mind, for better or worse and on the particular challenges that our species had to face throughout its evolution. Uh, these are, uh, there are several arguments for this and I'll give only two. First, if you think about the dual cognitive architecture mentioned earlier and how typically human it seems to be and how spiritual intelligence is located as the unique interplay between these two minds that we have, um, I will actually double down on this and say that spiritual intelligence in this sense is related to a built-in vulnerability that we have because the two minds are most of the times not in harmony with each other. Um, the algorithmic detached left hemispheric type of cognition is more dominant than it should be. As Fraser uh, demonstrated, 
Spiritual intelligence corrects for this and brings the two minds in harmony in a unique way. But this also makes for a very particular type of creature that has this dual cognitive architecture in the first place and whose two main cognitive engines are in imbalance and in need of rebalancing. There's no way, I mean, there's no way to, to, to even conceive uh, AI uh, in this way. Secondly, if we look at spiritual intelligence from an evolutionary anthropological lens and ask what were the needs for which those early humans developed such a unique, unique way of thinking about the world, uh, it becomes clear again how closely spiritual intelligence is tied to the contingencies of the evolution of the Homo sapiens. It's difficult to pinpoint when exactly spiritual intelligence emerged in human evolution. So uh, our best uh, guess is to tie it down to the evolution of religion. Now, why and how religion evolved is a highly contentious issue. But just briefly, let's say that uh, we used to think it had to do with thinking and reasoning, uh, but modern theories relate religion more with the body. So people used to theorize that early humans uh, must have invented religion because they needed causal explanations for the phenomena they observed. But nowadays, we think that early religion had much more to do with the body and its needs than with theories about the world. Uh, for example, as shown in a previous research project at the ISSR, spearheaded by the anthropologist Robin Dunbar, who Fraser mentioned, uh, the emergence of religion was very much related, apparently, to the needs of early humans, like social bonding mediated by huge endorphin release through rituals in hunter-gatherer communities, and then the mitigation of social friction and enhancement of collaboration on larger scales in agricultural communities and the first cities. And I find this particularly insightful for speculations on potentially, uh, potential robot religiosity or spiritual intelligence. Because most discussions today about robots and religions, including those typified by the Google engineer uh, and his chatbot, they revolve around notions of doctrine and what might be plausible for robots to believe in. Uh, in other words, when people think of religious robots, the focus is usually on beliefs. Would their reasoning abilities lead the robots naturally to conclude that the universe was created by an intelligent God? Would the robots be Christian? And this resembles the outdated view of how early humans became interested in religion. But if we look at the most up-to-date views, the emergence of religion and spiritual intelligence uh, is highly contingent on our particular embodiment, needs, vulnerabilities, and evolutionary challenges. So were robots to develop religion, it is highly unlikely that something similar to our religion would emerge. Without AI having a similar type of body and a cognitive structure that is similar to our own, and without undergoing similar evolutionary hurdles. And that might be true for spiritual intelligence too. Um, it is impossible to imagine how such a, a hyper-rational entity would be like and behave but it would most certainly be non-human-like. Um, now, uh, AI is already very non-human-like, but AGI might get even weirder. Uh, I say this, uh, uh, let's, let's start with current, uh, with current uh, AI. Uh, current AI solves problems in a way very differently from how humans do it. So for example, if you look at these very impressive machine learning algorithms, they need hundreds of thousands of, example to, to, of examples to, to learn a, a certain concept or to distinguish, for example, between a cat and a dog, whereas humans can sometimes do it only one example. That's one idea. The other idea is if you look at the, um, at the kind of mistakes that AI makes, they are very non-human-like mistakes. So some, uh, sometimes these algorithms are, on average, better than human experts. But when you look at the kind of mistakes that they make when they make mistakes, they are something that a human would never uh, would never confuse, um, and uh, there are the, the, this is very well documented. But if we look at the uh, uh, if we go further and we think about uh, artificial general intelligence, and uh, well, whether it would have a mind or not, this is a big if. Uh, we don't know for sure whether consciousness can emerge in in uh, in artifacts. But let's say, for the sake of the argument, that it could. Uh, I'm saying here that even if that was the case, uh, AI would be a very, very alien type of mind. 
because of, of, of a few reasons. One is that it would perceive the world, so its world of perception, its Merkwelt, uh, this is a German word, uh, uh, it would be very much different from, from our own. It would have different types of senses. So not only seeing in infrared or um, or uh, listening in, 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 in other um, acoustic registers, but having entirely in, entire new types of senses altogether. For example, sensing somebody's presence just from their connected devices. So in a sense, smelling, if you want, somebody's digital footprint. And it would have an intuitive knowledge of who that person is without even uh, looking at them through camera or listening to their voice. And that's something very alien that we can barely imagine. We have a lot of commonality with the animals, although notoriously it is impossible to imagine what it would be like to be a bat. But if you think of AI, AI is much further down the line from, from, from any non-human animal. So uh, we, could, we couldn't even comprehend what such a mind would be. Also because AI would have complete access to its own internal processes and memories. So AI would not forget anything. Uh, AI could theoretically store it, its whole world of uh, memories together. Whereas humans forget a lot. And uh, if you look at sci-fi stories, sometimes you can see uh, experiments, uh, 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 authors playing with this idea of what a human that would never forget anything, what, what that would be like. And it's very, very alien-like. Um, as I said, most of, most of the things that make humans as they are is the fact is, is, is due to the fact that we don't know ourselves very well. So we try to explore this in relationships, through art, through literature, and so on. Whereas an entity that would have complete knowledge of its algorithm, it would even could even play with those algorithms. Uh, um, we that, that's a that's a very I mean it would have very different needs and very different motivations. Perhaps it would be not very so much motivated to 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 join personal relationships um, and so on. And I will give you just one more example about uh, the the alienness of of, of uh, AGI, and that is the perception of time. So um, time uh, uh, is um, apparently because uh, electric current can can run much faster through through wire than it does through biological tissue. That would also mean that uh, these AI minds, even if they are human level, let's say, uh, they would still uh, think much faster than us. Conservative estimates are at about 10,000 times faster. And if such an entity was considered to have some uh, uh, interiority, some, some mind, uh, that mind would perceive the passage of time proportionally faster. So, uh, uh, proportionally slower, sorry. So, um, you can imagine an AI that looks at the world around us and it perceives it 10 times slower than a human mind. This poses a lot of ethical questions about whether we were to imprison AI uh, for, uh, because uh, then a year in prison would amount to 10,000 years of subjective uh, imprisonment for the, for the robot. But uh, just think about the weirdness of such a world. So uh, a nice comparison is that this 10,000 fold difference is almost the same as the difference between humans and plants. So an AI watching humans go about their lives would be just like a human watching a garden grow. Uh, that's what the AI would see. So uh, the AI would inhabit a completely different world of perception because of its perception of time. Uh, some people speculate that it, it, it would even in, perhaps inhabit the quantum world, which makes brings another level of weirdness to, to the discussion. But all this is to say that, uh, when we look at sci-fi, sometimes these robots are pictured as very human-like. So it's just like they have the same the same kind of questions that we are, the same kind of longings. But that will not be possible, I think. I mean, that will be a huge, huge coincidence if, in the space of all possible minds, a robot mind would uh, would have the the same kind of particularities that a human mind that if emerged through through uh, natural uh, evolution through natural selection. Um, acquired. So in conclusion, discussions about robots becoming spiritually intelligent might hinge not so much on them being intelligent beyond measure, but on their human likeness. And intelligence and human likeness are likely orthogonal, so one could easily feature without the other. 
But if we look at current developments in AI, uh, this is absolutely not the case. So large language models such as ChatGPT and Lambda might produce outputs that look and sound very human-like to the extent that they might even convince people of their personhood, sentience, and humanness. But their inner workings are radically different from how human minds and brains work to produce similar verbal or behavioral outputs. So human level competency is not the same with human-like intelligence. And uh, for religiosity and spirituality, the latter seems to be what matters, human likeness, not, human, not only human level. So if the limitations of the human nature are as important as they seem to be for the emergence of spiritual intelligence, then I think it is a safe bet to say that uh, artificial general intelligence will likely not undergo similar developments without having the same kind of evolutionary constraints and needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marius. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there'll be an opportunity for everyone to join in discussion with questions and comments um, shortly. Um, but before that, I'd like to invite Harris Wiseman to come in with any questions or comments of his, then probably Marius and I will respond and then we'll throw the floor open. Harris, over to you, Harris Wiseman. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Brilliant. Okay, yes, I have two questions. Uh, one will be for Fraser, uh, one will be for Marius. Uh, first question, uh, and I know Fraser, you've got a lot to say about these things. Um, your, your talk um, put spiritual intelligence mostly in an individual context. I wonder, if, uh, and you also mentioned the embodiment of spiritual intelligence. What I'd like to I'd like you to expand a bit more on the social relational aspects of spiritual intelligence, and um, you know, more, say more on the embodiment, the, the posture, the practical aspects of spiritual intelligence. That's the first question uh, for Marius. Um, as you know, we've uh, just had this excellent ISSR conference on spiritual intelligence. Um, during that conference, we had like many, um, many beautiful presentations on uh, different uh, marginalized aspects of spirituality. We saw spirituality in those with dementia, spirituality with those with uh, learning difficulties, uh, proto-spirituality in, uh, in animals. It was a, it was a very inclusive, uh, groups that we were talking to and uh, uh, I, I know you know my answer on this but like uh, there was quite a bit of pushback from some members of the group about the very idea of a uh, spiritual intelligence that's so rooted in not only the human being uh, but uh, potentially some really high level capacities in the human being. Uh, there were a lot of people that wanted to uh, be much more inclusive uh, as to what spirituality is. So I wonder like how, how you'd uh, uh, respond to like that, that, that pushback that seemed to be saying that the very concept of spiritual intelligence is uh, either too anthropocentric or too, uh, not, not too elite, but like too dependent on like really high level qualities. Thank you. So thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to your question to me first. I'm, I'm tempted to respond to the question to Marius as well, but I'll uh, refrain from doing that. Um, I, um, um, I, I accept that the way I talk about intelligence is quite individualistic. It's more individualistic than I'm comfortable with. And I think there has been a significant shift in intellectual history to thinking about intelligence in an individualistic way. I date it roughly from the late 19th century when sort of so much of the intellectual landscape shifted around. Um, but, it, but of course, it's a kind of gradual thing. It's never, it's sort of one day it's one thing, the next day it's something else. 
Um, but I think the, um, the development of IQ tests is a significant marker in the development of an individ individualistic way of thinking about intelligence. And if you go back to an earlier literature, um, and I'm drawing this partly from a, a, a brilliant book that I love by Owen Barfield, History in English Words, where he uses the way words have changed their meaning as a guide to how thought has changed. Um, he says that intelligence used to be something that you partake in, not a property of an individual human being that you can measure in an IQ test, not a property that uh, a device may or may not have, but something in which you partake. And I think there's something really important about that. And I was pointing in that direction when I talked about spiritual intelligence being in inherently participatory and relational. Um, it's not something that you can do just in a, in, a, in a lonely world on your own. And I think that this connects with embodiment as well. I mean, our, our interaction with the social world um, is always an embodied interaction. We sort of um, meet physically with other people. And that's an important kind of interaction. The interaction we're having now is, is a sort of um, rather poor um, cousin of the embodied interaction we have with people who we meet, meet in person. And I'd want to say that these these aspects of spiritual intelligence, the participatory, the relational, the embodied, are particularly, they're particularly important with spiritual intelligence more than with most kinds of intelligence, certainly more than with conceptual intelligence. But we live in such an individualistic culture, it's difficult to talk about them without slipping back into that kind of individualistic mode of talk. So that's my answer to, to your question to me. I'll let Marius answer the other question. Thank you, Fraser. And you can certainly come back uh, uh, if you have something to add to or to contradict me on this. Uh, I would love to hear it. Well, uh, indeed, the question of anthropocentrism is very important. But I think it is also uh, uh, this question emerges from um, confusion between spiritual intelligence and spirituality. Or if we define spiritual intelligence as just the ability to know God, then of course, uh, restricting it to humans is uh, a little bit problematic, especially restricting, restricting it to some type of humans, because as you mentioned, there are there is a spectrum of humans and some of them seem to be excluded for this, from this type of... But I, we do not define spiritual intelligence that way. Uh, spiritual intelligence just happens to be the way the human mind works when it comes to, to things like this. And uh, the fact that the human mind works as it does is highly contingent on the conditions in which the human mind emerged. And does, this does not mean that other species do not have a relationship with God or even the potential uh, alien AI that I was talking about. Maybe, maybe it will have its own type of spiritual intelligence. But if we are to, uh, I mean, the assumption we make is that there is something very, special about how humans uh, engage uh, 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 spiritual questions and spiritual life and then how that informs how they uh, approach uh, their whole existence. And, um, and one thing that we try to debunk is just the one assumption is that the kind of intelligence that is measured with IQ is all there is. So for example, if you just enhance machines uh, uh, high enough and they become super competent as this type of intelligence, perhaps they will just rationally uh, 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 immediately come to, come, come to the faith, which is probably not the case. That's, that's one of the things. Uh, and uh, uh, the other idea is that, um, well, I think I lost my thread of thought, but uh, for, for sure, uh, we do not restrict the uh, opportunity to, to know God and to be in a relationship with God to the, part, to the specific uh, type of uh, human spiritual intelligence. Uh, that is, and if, uh, but it also means that, uh, I mean, I would be very surprised if the spiritual intelligence as it exists in humans is this kind of platonic uh, 
a thing existing high above everything else that species converge to. I think from a Christian point of view, you can make a case that species, given enough time, might converge to some sort of relationality with God, but the way it happens in every particular species would be contingent on what that species needs and, uh, and minds are. And this is just the way uh, uh, it happens in, in humans. And uh, I don't think uh, AI, uh, just advanced enough AI, would immediately have existential questions precisely because if we tie existential questions to spiritual intelligence in humans, the way this emerged was not very rational uh, sitting on a stone and asking yourself questions about why things are the way they are, but it was more embodied and related to, to our evolutionary needs. Fraser, do you want to come in? No, I, I agree absolutely with that. So, I mean, humans have a distinctive kind of um, spiritual intelligence. What's distinctive is that we can reflect on the fact that it is a spiritual or religious intelligence in a self-conscious way. Um, other species can certainly have um, a different kind of less reflective um, apprehension of the divine or the transpersonal. Um, but we do it differently because we have this distinctive kind of, um, of conceptual capacity. So let me bring other people in who'd like to come in. Um, Roger's looking as though he might be on the verge of saying something. Okay, go on. I, I wanted to leave space for the people, but I'm happy to jump in. Um, so firstly, I've really enjoyed the presentations and the conversations. So thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating food for thought. Um, the, what, the, the kind of question that, that I'd like to pose probably is to both of you. I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Because it seems to me that in trying to sort of understand what spiritual intelligence is, we find ourselves sort of drawing on some sort of very familiar distinctions. So we sort of hear uh, Barnard and Teasdale talking about conceptual versus holistic and intuitive um, thinking, processing, uh, drawing on um, Ian McGilchrist's sort of, I mean, he he sort of maps that onto the, the hemispheres, but it's not just that, it's sort of different ways of thinking. The, the, the sort of distinction I haven't heard you talk about very much, which to me seems to be quite close to the notion of spiritual intelligence and sort of gets close to those sort of ideas, is that various spiritualities talk a lot about sort of either egoic awareness or or something beyond the ego that's something about spirituality is like getting beyond the sort of small conceptualization of the self to something much bigger um some some spirituality sort of draw on um heideggerian philosophy and we'll talk about the difference between ego awareness and what it might say eco awareness which has a, a much greater sense of connectedness with others with the world with other things I, I'm just wondering um, where you would see that sitting in some of the ideas already that you've talked about um, in terms of spiritual um, intelligence. Where where does this sort of notion of sort of escaping or or moving beyond the constructs of the ego sit in 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 your thinking so far? It's a very interesting question, and I think there is something inherently unbounded in the spiritual way of, of understanding the world. And that, um, on, on, on the face of things, I think sort of takes it off in, in a different direction um, from AI. I mean, AI seems to me to have inherited the rather individualistic assumptions uh, of, of we have about intelligence now, albeit applying them to devices rather than to humans. Um, but uh, I think the assumptions of cybernetics, which were part of the soil from which AI emerged, are much more congenial from this from this point of view. Um, AI, sorry, cybernetics was a kind of system theory. It did not assume that the, the, the device was boundaried. It was, it, it, on principle, it was interested in the context in which the, 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 the um, intelligence was operating. And that's important, I think, that kind of contextualized intelligence. Um, 
I, 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 I guess a lot of animals have that kind of contextualized eco intelligence. I mean, they understand themselves in a broader ecological context, um, not just sort of thinking about themselves as intelligent uh, creatures, but sort of seeing themselves in context. It's an inherently interactive kind of intelligence. And um, the um, the kind of intelligence that sees yourself in the in the broader transpersonal reality is, in a sense, I think, a similar kind of eco intelligence, but moved moved up a notch. Um, and as I say, I think I think cyst cybernetics is much more open to those kind of assumptions than AI is. And um, I would quite like to sort of see um, a revisiting of the more open-minded, um, contextualized assumptions of, of cybernetics. And I think that might actually help AI to um, find a way through some of what seemed to be its impasses. But Marius, you may want to come in on that as well. Thank you. I completely agree with that. I just wanted to add that uh, if you look at the at spiritual practices and the kind of attitudes that they try to instill, uh, well, superficially, it might look like the practitioner wants to become a better person also in this ego mode, like just exploring the depths of oneself and just uh, you think of the hermit in, his, in, in the desert or in his proverbial cell and so on. But if you look at what actually happens, is that most of the most of these activities are designed to promote sociality, and they are designed to to be re, to reintegrate the person in community. So, uh, in a sense, the, the the reason why we go into mindfulness or Jesus prayer or or, or other types of meditative meditative practices is that we want to increase our receptivity to, to the other. So uh, in a sense, to exit the, the loops of this very rational type of mind, which can be blinded to, and McGilchrist uh, has a lot to say about this. But uh, uh, re that's why uh, relationality is not only the way spiritual intelligence works, but it is also one of the outcomes, increased re relationality and uh, attunement to the world so uh, an open receptivity towards out, what's out there that's what you see usually in uh, um, paragons of spiritual intelligence uh, and uh, i found that to be very interesting because my my very uh, um, caricatural idea of the of the spiritual person was exactly this kind of person who was just trying to see the divine light uh, and uh, for, for its sake, so to experience this very high octane, uh, uh, powerful spiritual experiences. But if you look at that, uh, and that's also what something that Rowan Williams said, if you look at the life of mystics, those kinds of experiences are usually perhaps placed towards the beginning of their spiritual journey, just to, to give them a head start. But then the more they become spiritually mature, uh, they don't need this kind of experiences. So their life becomes more mundane in a certain sense seen from that perspective but there it's actually uh, their receptivity towards what is not oneself is is enhanced and the uh, communion and relationality thank you as you mentioned rome williams i might just add that rome williams gave a talk at the at the recent conference we had on spirit and ecology which we recorded and which will be on the um, ISSR YouTube channel before long. There are a couple of people still with us who haven't come in yet. If either of them would like to, Danny or Stefan, you're, you're very welcome. Um, um, maybe, maybe, maybe. Hi, yes, thank you for the invitation. Um, a bit of an introduction. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Chicago Divinity School. Um, and I'm very intrigued and interested in these topics. One um, question I, I have maybe primarily for Fraser, but uh, I would love your thoughts as well, Marius. Uh, towards, towards the end of your talk, Fraser, you talked about the, um, uh, you, you argued that spiritual practices are uh, tools for um, reducing the, uh, the, the conceptual, um, uh, the weight that conceptual cognition has in our um, in our overall cognition, and I wonder if you uh, have any thoughts or or insights around um, 
how we might understand the efficacy of spiritual practices at um, actually achieving that goal. Are there maybe certain uh, practices that are more efficacious than others? How, how would we go about understanding that? Um, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, in, interesting question. I mean, my thinking about this is still evolving, so my thoughts are perhaps a bit disorganized. Um, I'm interested at the moment in how, in how different spiritual practices go about this in different ways. Um, and um, recently I've been considering a threefold classification of spiritual practices advanced by Rupert Sheldrake in a, in, in a book called Ways That Go Beyond or something like that. Um, and he has three, and I'm sort of putting it in my own words rather than his words, but I think it's the same threefold distinction. There are those that sort of um, shrink the subsystems in which um, activity is happening. So they take you into a still state, rather passive state of deep contemplation. And he gives chanting um, uh, as, as one of those. There are some that involve um, physical activity and yoga and other similar um, exercises, I think, are the most obvious of those. And there are some that involves kind of rethinking how you see things um, and um, the spiritual um, exercise of practicing gratitude on which there's been quite a bit of work in positive psychology will be one of those. So kind of stillness, um, mental activity or physical activity. I think these are, the, these are the three main routes. I suspect they all get you to the same kind of place, but they may do so in, uh, in, in, by different routes. Um, and if so, that would be very interesting. You'd need quite a sophisticated study with a range of measures and sort of following people through um, the acquisition of skill in these exercises over a number of weeks to sort of plot the pathway by which it goes. But that's roughly the kind of um, empirical investigation of these things that I'm currently contemplating. Marius may have something he wants to add to that. I was just going to invite you if you want to say more about uh, the difference between mantra-based meditation and uh, mindfulness type of meditation uh, in promoting the kind of things that we are talking about, uh, because I know you've, you've done quite a lot of computational modeling of both. Yes. So, um, I mean, the, um, mindfulness sort of um, avoids words. I think, um, and sort of um, uh, shrinks the range of things that, to, that you're paying attention to. There's less sort of focused attention to anything linguistic. I think um, mantra-based practices, TM, the Jesus Prayer, they use words, but in a different kind of way. Um, repetitive, evocative, um, incantatory, um, hard to find sort of the right exact kind of vocabulary for it. But I think that's the choice, whether you try to avoid words altogether or whether you use them differently. Stefan, would you? Stefan, would you? Um, yes, yeah, greetings from South Africa. Um, I'm also a recent graduate, so I still have very limited expertise and so on, but I'll try to ask some sort of sensible question. Um, originally, I thought my question might be directed at Marius, but now it seems that it mo might be, I don't know, you both can answer, I guess. Um, so we said something about spiritual intelligence um, and the embodiment thereof. Um, so just kind of as a foundation, I just want to um, emphasis, emphasize the cognitive, affective kind of nature of embodiment. And once we kind of have that as the assumption, my question then, um, when you think, I would just maybe as a disclaimer, this question is very much um, theological and maybe even overly biblical, but um, I'll let you handle that. Um, when we think of trauma theory and the impact of trauma um, in the development of religion, I think in, thinking about Judaism, Christianity, and so on, the entire line of trauma through the biblical narratives and so on, um, with the assumption that robots and AI in general um, can't experience any form of trauma, 
Um, how will trauma theory play into the possibility of robots actually having spiritual intelligence? Marius, you want to have a go at that? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, because I think it's always dangerous to speak about these things in a positive note. So to say, oh, uh, I think theologically you can say that God takes even the worst things of this world and uh, transforms them and repurposes them in, in, a, good, uh, uh, in a good direction. So uh, I think this is the way in which trauma uh, permeates, in a sense, the spiritual traditions. And uh, uh, I don't know if trauma would be um, just um, required for, for, for robot spiritual intelligence. I didn't go that far. I was talking about vulnerability. And when I was talking about vulnerability, I was also talking about uh, imperfection in cognition. So, uh, um, because when I'm looking at, uh, especially how hum humans rely on very, uh, very strange heuristics in making decisions, uh, they are most of the times that they are not rational, but they work somehow. Uh, so they, they get us uh, uh, further into the world. Uh, whereas robots, uh they they make these decisions based on very very cold statistical calculations and that's why for me such a creature could never be person like because it would uh, it would miss precise maybe some randomness can be introduced in the system but it's not the same and uh uh so I don't know. Trauma seems uh, uh, seems. I mean, I, I'm not committing to that, but uh, I do think that if if robots could experience trauma, uh, that could play in their in their very particular type of spirituality. But of course, that would require sentience. That would require reflexive require reflexivity on the part of robots. I'm curious what Fraser has to say about this because he knows more about uh, the topic of trauma in psychology and religion. Yes. I mean, I, I don't have much to add beyond the, sort of the obvious point that sort of um, um, trauma is, is, is important in sort of building depth of personality. I mean, so I'm thinking of the kind of um, soul making theodicies where, where, where people draw attention to the role of suffering in, in building the soul. Um, that's sometimes misunderstood. I don't think it should be seen as a way of, sort of justifying suffering, but it's a, a line of thought that draws attention to the to the um, positive impact of um, of um, suffering and trauma in human life. I mean, we live in a rather hedonistic culture that tends to assume that uh, nice things are good for you and bad things are bad for you. But um, but there is this alternative view um, that um, the good things are not necessarily not the nice things, but the things that draw you closer to God. Um, um, so, I, I mean, um, that's, that's all I have to add, I think, on that. If I may just come back with one sentence, I was just re uh, reminded of, a, of an image that became viral a few weeks ago when there was this protest of the Writers Guild in Hollywood because they were being replaced by for uh, writing screenplays and so on uh, by ChatGPT. And there was this writer who had a banner who said ChatGPT doesn't have childhood trauma. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was her, her pitch for, for staying employed. And that's interesting that uh, humans do that anyway. We have a couple of hands up and then welcome back to Niels Gregerson. And if a, a little later you'd like to come in, you'll be very welcome. Go to Roger Bretherton next. So I, I realized I didn't introduce myself earlier. So I, I'm a clinical psychologist working in academia. I wrote my doctorate on trauma um, originally. And, and interestingly, when I was writing my doctorate in the 90s, one of the most sort of popular models of cognitive models of trauma in those days was actually based on sort of early heuristic systems um, and what could go wrong with them. Um, and so it's really a notion of trauma being a shattering our, of our assumptions. So if we say in a positive direction, that shattering we might view as something like wonder, where something arrives that's much bigger than we are and we can't accommodate it in any way. Um, trauma seems to do that in a negative way. And um, the, the cognitive psychologist who was very popular uh, in those days, Chris Bruin, um, like to refer to a, a study that was done with the early heuristic systems that were involved in doing really simple things like how do you identify a bird 
And um, he describes one particular study where the, the system is taught that all birds can fly. And then when it's handed a penguin to classify, it goes into this sort of catastrophic meltdown and in the end ends up concluding that no birds can fly. Um, if a penguin can't fly and it's still a bird, then it, it breaks the assumption, you know, the entire assumptive world that it's living in. Uh, and this was a sort of model of trauma that, that was actually relatively popular for a while, that, that there are other, other assumptions we all carry about the world being fair, um, trauma having to other people and not to us, um, of things being controllable, um, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and it seems to me that one of the things as AI systems become increasingly sophisticated, uh, it, it's the moments when their assumptions are sort of broken that I think are, are the equivalents to the, the human experience of trauma. Uh, and for human beings, they became moments of learning and development. And I wonder whether, in essence, we're sort of asking the same question about AI is, you know, it would be the ways in which AI systems encounter things that violate previous assumptions that will lead to that, that kind of growth, I suspect. Interesting. Thank you. Niels, is there anything you'd like to come in and say? Thank you very much. I'm Nils Gregerson, uh, um, a systematic theologian here at Copenhagen University. I had to change location, therefore I was out for, for, for 20 minutes. Um, thank you also for, uh, for, uh, for, for the lectures. I think that what I have learned is that the as one who has not dealt with this problem uh, in, the, in the manner that you have, is that we need to have an, an investment or a, a, a coupling of of the uh, of the cognitive and the spiritual uh, facilities, and this then also relates to to something like em empathy and the question of whether a, 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 a chatbot or whatever can feel em empathy. I think that in empathy we need quite a lot of discernment. I mean the the capacity to see what is salient importance for another person and that can relate to the gestures uh, of the uh, the the eyes and the, the the face and the movement and the retraction and whatever and of course to what is said too so i i would uh, what if would it be possible to say that at least that an, an artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, that artificial intelligence would would have a, could have a very strong could be coded or could learn to have a very strong discernment of what might be uh, problematic for another person. But I would then argue that this would not mean that the computer actually has empathy. It would just mean that there would be some of the uh, some of the um, discerning qualities and the the capacity to to, to read a, a, a pattern out of very complex bodily and 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 and, uh, and linguistic uh, articulations and then knowing or in a sense knowing uh, uh, by the by the algorithm that this is probably a sign of of uh, trauma in the other uh, person but my point would be and i guess that this is what i've heard today also that this would not eo ipso suggest a capacity for, for for empathy for an inward understanding of what empathy is do i get this point correctly from both uh, uh, from all three of you yes uh, i think so exactly so um i can certainly envisage how you could do um in principle do computational modeling of empathy um, empathy is not very well understood in psychology, but if it was better understood, we should do we could do computational modeling of empathy, as William has done computational modeling of caregiving and friendship. That's perfectly achievable. But I think um, um, William's computer doesn't actually have friendship. A computer wouldn't actually have empathy. And um, there's something to do with experience or embodiment. Um, that is crucial for actually having these things. And I like what you say about an enmeshment of um, cognition and spirituality. Um, 
And I think that's a helpful way of rephrasing what both Marius and I were trying to say in different ways, that um, the combination of different kinds of central cognition that humans have may, gives them a particular and fruitful kind of spiritual intelligence that you don't find in computers and you don't find in the same way in other species. Marius, do you want to add anything to that? Well, just to, to agree with uh, with Niels that indeed uh, the two are not the same. So a simulation of something is very different from an emulation of something. And uh, I'm not even sure that a simulation of empathy can be achieved just to say, I mean, it, it theoretically, you could think of a, a computer algorithm that can discern between various facial expressions and then match them with various internal possible states of a human being and respond appropriately if programmed. But I think there, uh, there's been recently a lot of discussion about the diversity of ways in which humans express uh, emotion that uh, just from facial recognition, it might be uh, impossible for computers to draw very general conclusions. We are very different and we, especially culturally, uh, Scandinavia right. from Southern Europe, from Africa, from Asia, South America, and so on. So, uh, but maybe let's say with good enough AI, yeah, you could, let's say you could do that. But then, uh, of course, uh, uh, it all boils down to the hard problem of consciousness, first and foremost. So to feel empathy, you would have to have an, a sentient entity in the first place. And even a sentient entity, if its mind would be very alien-like, then, uh, the, the, I mean, for us, we have these mirror neurons and so on. So we are very similar. We have this skin with each other. So that's what makes it even scarier for me a little bit, uh, also from an ethical perspective, that you could have this very cold type of intelligence uh, understanding what's going on so deeply in, in the other person without having the same kind of vulnerability itself. And one of the one of the reasons why we share so much in therapy with human therapists is precisely because we know there is a, a, a feeling person behind the uh, the face, and the, we trust them in a sense to 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 handle that that information. Uh, sens uh, sensibly, whereas uh, um, an algorithm could be trained to perhaps not do not do bad things with that information, but it still makes for a very strange experience to talk about very deep things to an entity that doesn't know what what that is uh, ultimately. Yeah. If not, I. Sorry. Yes, please. Yeah. I, I just had to, I don't know if this is a short question, but um, I was, Marius, I was really struck by the statement in your presentation um, where I, I, I may get the statement wrong, but you said something to the effect of a perfectly um, rational entity or perfectly rational being would not take the risk or the vulnerability involved in needing relationships. I think you said something like that. I, and that struck me immediately as a fascinating idea and I immediately thought it was right. And then the more I've thought about it over the last hour or so, the more I've started to wonder, wouldn't a perfectly rational being move eventually in the opposite direction, which is the safest place we can possibly be as a being is within a network of relationships. So I, I'm just wondering, um, I, I mean, I'm sharing my thoughts with you as I go along, I'm just wondering what, what comments you would make on that. Yes, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, I was just thinking about this very intuitively, for, just from the perspective of my own mind. And uh, you think about foolish things that you've done that some, somehow have landed you in a better place spiritually, emotionally. Uh, and uh, also, if you think about, well, the decision of who to partner with or who to marry, I mean, the logical thing to do is to interview as many candidates as possible, uh, ideally all of them, <laughs> and just find that that best candidate. Probably there is an algorithm that could say, well, uh, as if there is a 95% match, you can already stop. So there's, you can insert a stop uh, into the search tree. William, I think, uh, knows much more about this. I mean, AI algorithms, sometimes they do uh, navigate this, this kind of problems without going into a continuous loop of, of evaluating all the possibilities. Also in chess or so, you can, there are some possibilities you can dismiss or there are moves that are just good enough and, you, and the computer settles for them. But still, the, there are so many things that, I mean, most of the things that really make our lives enjoyable 
are the kind of things that it will be risky to do. And especially if you think about uh, a developing human and the kind of risks that uh, are, are, are took in, in, in early life, in adolescence and so on, which are very irrational, but they are so much, uh, so important for, for the health of, of, of human personhood that I could never imagine. And my comment was also triggered by uh, something I, I read in a, in a novel by Ian McEwan, Machines Like Me, where uh, the, the intelligent robot was telling uh, its human owner that when robots will take over, there will be no, no more need of literature because for humans, literature has been just a way of uh, ex exploring human nature throughout the centuries because we keep not understanding it completely. So we keep exploring, whereas uh, robots will not need that. And uh, I, I immediately saw it. So, I, okay, well, what, 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 how strange it is. And maybe perhaps the same it could be uh, said about relationships. Or if a, a robot would engage in relationships, they will be very transactional types of relationships. So the kind of relationship that we also engage in sometimes, but we don't like that about ourselves. And we don't want to be friends with somebody who is just calculating in their mind the, the cost-benefit uh, type of things. So, so uh, we that kind of person is repulsive to us. Uh, so uh, so uh, even more so, uh, um, um, yeah, this kind of very uh, rational, hyper-rational type of entity. So that's what I had in mind. I just want to come back to say that uh, it also has to, our irrationality sometimes, I think it also has to do with the fact that we don't stand that much to lose. I mean, we, we have finite lives anyway, so that's why we, we do take risks, and perhaps even more so towards the end of the life. But if you think of the kind of scenarios transhumanists talks about, about augmentation, then suddenly everything acquires this hyper importance, because why would you even cross the street if there is a slightest possibility of getting hit by a bus and losing a potential eternity? Or why would you go and have kids if uh, uh, overall the, there is this uh, net loss <laughs> in terms of uh, 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 energy and, and so on, and resources that have to be shared and things like this. So that's, I think this gives us a, a very uh, useful uh, way of, of, of thinking also about things. I mean, AI may, may be a very far-fetched scenario, but uh, augmenting our intelligence might be something that we have to, to deal with uh, even sooner. So the, the things that are valuable about ourselves, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very important to get those right. And the assumption that more intelligence is better is so ingrained in, in all, all the discussions about superintelligence and transhumanism that it almost goes unquestioned. So I think, at least from a theological perspective and also from aesthetics and humanities, you could bring a very uh, point, uh, powerful critique to that idea. And spiritual intelligence is a case where more intelligence, in a, uh, as, as understood as problem solving uh, or logical abilities, is not necessarily something good. To draw things to a close in the moment, I'd just like to give Roger a chance to come back to the, the interesting <laughs> conversation his remarks sparked, sparked off. Anything else you want to say? Um... I, I mean, I, I I don't think there is anything I want to say in response, actually, Fraser. So thank you for giving me the opportunity anyway. <laughs> OK, so I mean, uh, I was just prompted by what you said, Roger, to ask myself, is is God a supremely rational being? And in, well, it depends what you mean, I think. But in one way, I want to say yes. But then you could question whether the incarnation was a rational course of action. So um, that opens up some other territory about what you mean by rationality. But anyway, sorry to sort of throw that in in the, in the final seconds. I should wrap things up. Uh, just three quick things to say. Firstly, thank you for being here. It's been a very good and interesting discussion. So thank you for joining in. Secondly, we'd, we'd like to put this on YouTube. Um, we could make some edits, so if anyone who's contributed to the discussion would like not to be included in YouTube, then we can take you out, but it would be helpful to know. So um, easy for me to be in contact with the home team, as it were, but if um, Stefan and Danny could let us know whether they're happy for their contributions to be included, that would be helpful. Perhaps you could contact um, Anthony or myself. Um, so a, a thumbs up from Stefan. Um, so thank you for that. And Danny, are you, are you happy for us? He's saying in the chat that he is. 
Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you very much. So that wraps up. And the third and last thing for me to say is that this is just the first of four sessions. Uh, there are slightly different times. The next one is next Monday on spiritual conversations with companion machines. And the prime mover in this research was Yorick Wilkes, who sadly died just as his research was wrapping up. But um, various of his colleagues, including myself, will be presenting um, for him his research on um, um, spiritual conversation with computers. So, so thank you for being here. Um, great conversation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Please watch the ISSR YouTube channel and podcast for the next three episodes, which will be released over the course of the summer of 2023. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here and or heard, please consider clicking that like button and or subscribing and let us know what discussions you would like to see next. And make sure to see the rest of the content we have posted on our website for more academic discussions and content related to the field of science and religion. Bye for now and see you at the next ISSR in conversation. Mm -hmm.